Hello, and welcome to the Red Feather Genealogy Podcast. Going to be going back to the oldest and by far most popular video on the channel. Uh, it's <laughs> one that, in my opinion, has not really aged very well, and I'm not entirely proud of it, but a quarter of a million views later, hey, whatever, I'll take it. So, haplogroups. To address the many who have said that haplogroups are unimportant, well, often enough, that is the case. But they definitely should not be dismissed altogether because sometimes they are of major value, not only in others' trees, but in branches of your tree. So maybe not your lineage specifically, but say your mom's dad maybe has a paternal haplogroup that makes or breaks a case. A few examples. My own paternal haplogroup in the years since I've made that video has continued to go <laughs> pretty much nowhere. So it's admittedly um, not the best one to run with, but I mention it because I know nothing about where this line goes. I'm not sure what the name really is. It ends with my great, great, great grandpa who was something of an alien, a real weirdo. There are ancestral patterns that apply pretty much constantly one way or another, dealing with all the trees that I have, but this guy was like dropped off from a ship from Mars. I don't know. He is so bizarre. But I mention this because uh, the trail went from a very generic R1B result initially. I had thought that I was Mohawk all that if you've seen the other video. Later on 23andMe cinched it down to R1B U152. In other words, not just Celtic Western Europe somewhere, or possibly German, I guess that falls under R1B, but this was a specific branch of the Celts, the Alpine Celts in the center of the continent that fanned out in all directions. Well, this was interesting, but it didn't really point anywhere entirely helpful because it narrowed down the search to <clears throat> France, Italy, uh, Switzerland, Germany, Belgium, the Netherlands, and England. So, you know, I guess that handful of countries was slightly better than Western Europe in general. However, then... Living DNA came along, and they gave an even better result, a better subclade, as they're called. More specifically, down the path of, because uh, R1B is just Western Europe. Then you get the Celts around the mountains that I got. This one broke it down to Z150, I think it was. And this one pinned it down to much more either England or Germany. Still very frustrating. And my path could go one of many different ways. In the previous video, I was saying that maybe the line was French. That's still a possibility. I really don't know, but it's looking most like England and Germany. The point of it is, even if you don't get a helpful result, the science continues to improve and evolve, and it gets closer and closer and closer to pinpointing exactly what you're looking for. Fortunately, I have better examples to share. Another branch of my tree, this would be my grandma on my mom's side, her dad. She never knew this guy. Uh, eventually, you know, word got out that he drank himself into a hotel room, and that was about it. And uh, eventually I came along and figured out his parents beyond just names and the very fascinating story there. These people were Catholic ish, which stands out in my tree because I have a lot of Protestant denominations, especially Adventists. So Catholics were a real standout. But looking around, couldn't really find records on them, you know, getting baptized. And they showed up in Oregon from New York, and back there it was totally murky. They were up in the Catskills. And my grandma's dad was named Ed, but he went by the nickname Mickey. And as far as she was concerned, and this thrilled her to no end because she saw herself as very Irish, even though she turned out to not be very Irish at all, uh, 
he looked in her opinion like somebody Irish. You know, he just had the hat and the coat and kind of the attitude. And and he went by Mickey, so, you know, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, right? But I could never quite put my finger on it. Eventually, I figured out that the surname of the line, and this is drastically simplifying something to not get too far off track, the surname of the line had been changed from another name. The original name had nothing to do with the name that we knew. Basically, my great-great-grandpa was somebody in New York, and then he was somebody else in Oregon. It took years to figure this out, and I got very fortunate to end up making the connection through cousins. That name could have easily been Irish or French. It's like, all right, Ireland and France, two Catholic countries. Okay, this is starting to whittle down a little bit more. Now, this is where I go a little bit above and beyond in the research that I do. Because one thing about FTDNA is their basic test does not include haplogroups, but you can test your haplogroup for very, very, very specific results. It costs a lot of money, and I haven't done it myself, kind of, unfortunately, but the good news is you can look up projects by name. So if you have the name Smith, for example, you can look up the FTDNA Smith project, and it'll have a great many people with the name Smith and what haplogroups they have going back. And you can see, if you are a Smith, where you fit into that, or maybe you don't. It's by means like this that they figure out that uh, non-paternal events, in other words, adoptions, infidelities, and whatnot, might happen, and uh, maybe this Smith line got derailed and you're not really a Smith, that kind of thing. So I looked up the name, the true name of my grandma's paternal line, and uh, it, I did end up finding it. It went back to the same ancestry that she had, and I didn't have any reason to believe that there was any hanky-panky going on. And sure enough, it ended up being haplogroup G. The specifics of that aren't really important here, except to say that G runs very lightly into Western France and not really at all into Ireland. So, bada boom, eventually figured out through this roundabout means <laughs> over years and emails and improving technology that my grandma's paternal line was in fact French originally at some point. They showed up over here in um, southern upstate New York, as funny as that kind of sounds, and I don't know if they took being Catholic necessarily all that seriously. I don't know if it's a really Catholic strong bed kind of area. And so the last echoes of that showed up in Oregon just enough to reach me to get me on this trail to trace it back 300 years into western France. So that was a nice little convergence of research events. The next example is way more straightforward. Uh, in dealing with the channel cheerleader, uh, her dad had been adopted, and this is how we met. She wanted to figure out where her dad came from. And essentially everything hinged on a couple pieces of paper, one of which said that the father was Serbian. And that's very specific. Uh, they got some very, very uh, nice notes on this guy who apparently wasn't in the picture very long. It was one of those Navy rendezvous during the war, you know what I mean? So, yeah, we had him test, and uh, he ended up having not just a haplogroup that might be from the region, <laughs> like mine, a really kind of vague nebulous one. His was such a slam dunk of just this wildly specific, rare paternal haplogroup that only really happens among Serbs. It's uh, some crazy subclade of haplogroup N or P or something. See, this is how much I prepare for these videos. I don't even know. But it was so specific that it even had a decimal point in it, which I didn't know happened with haplogroups. So just like that, yeah, you're a Serb, and there's no two ways about it. You are as Serb as Serb gets. Uh, I should also mention with these examples that 
one should not overemphasize the importance of haplogroups. In other words, if you share the same one with a match, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. For example, I've got my R1B paternal line, which gets more specific eventually over time, but my maternal group is H. H is literally half the women in Europe. It could come from anywhere. As it happens, I know the exact village that it came from in Scotland, but it could be from absolutely anywhere. So if you get on 23andMe and you've got H, and you got a relative that has H, it doesn't particularly mean anything unless unless you get a really close match. I watched this happen a few years ago. Uh, I was living with somebody who was aware of a half-sister who had been born 10 years before her. Didn't have a name, but did have a birthday and just knew that they had the same mom. Uh, at some point, she got into 23andMe. It might have had something to do with living with a genealogy fanatic. So she took the test, and she got back her results, and at the top of her list of matches was an extremely strong match, and they both had maternal haplogroup H3. That's still a very, very widely encompassing haplogroup, but the fact that this person shared such a massive chunk of DNA, and they had the same haplogroup, and when they got in contact, sure enough, her half-sister had actually taken the test previously and was waiting to see if her family ever took a test and showed up, and bada-bing, everything fell into place. So sometimes it's a nice clue, but you got to be pretty closely related. I mean, half of 23andMe's results probably match me on age. So as for where you get haplogroups, I can't speak to the FTDNA test because that costs a big chunk of money and I keep trying to find workarounds to not have to do that. In the meantime, Ancestry does not have this. The funny thing is, I got that first very vague result from Ancestry when this is all they were doing before the whole autosomal came along. And, you know, it's, it's the ethnicity breakdowns, like a little bit of, you know, Britain here and a little bit of Serbia there, that kind of thing. Uh, as long before any of that, any of the companies were really doing that. But then Ancestry dropped the haplogroups when they started doing the autosomal, like, really intensively. But 23andMe has always done it, as far as I know. So you can get a result through 23andMe. I mean, this is if you think it's helpful. If, like, an adoptee situation or something, every scrap of information helps, obviously. Uh, Living DNA is the company where I got the better subclade, the more specific information. It's not been enough information yet, but it costs the same as the other two companies, and it was much, much better in that regard. Otherwise, as much as I love Living DNA, they seem to be not really doing anything or making any advancements over there. So I guess I can't really recommend them for this, particularly, unless you're just really adamant about getting a better subclade. So at the end of the day, if you think this might help, and it probably will help more than you actually realize, I would go with 23andMe for that and many other reasons. So I hope this has been of some help to somebody somewhere, and thank you for listening. Feel free to like and subscribe, and I'll be talking to you again soon.